Chapter 26, The Gardener's Call. Here is a letter with an Indian stamp for you, Aunt Jimsy, said Phil. Here are three for Stella and two for Pris and a glorious fat one for me from Joe. There's nothing for you, Anne, except a circular. Nobody noticed Anne's flush as she took the thin letter. Phil tossed her carelessly, but a few minutes later, Phil looked up to see a transfigured Anne. Honey, what good thing has happened? The youth's friend has accepted a little sketch I sent them a fortnight ago, said Anne, trying hard to speak as if she were accustomed to having sketches accepted every mail, but not quite succeeding. Anne Shirley, how glorious! What was it? When is it to be published? Did they pay you for it? Yes, they've sent a check for ten dollars, and the editor writes that he would like to see more of my work. Dear man, he shall. It was only an old sketch I found in my box. I rewrote it and sent it in, but I never really thought it would be accepted because it had no plot, said Anne, recalling the bitter experience of Avril's atonement. What are you going to do with that ten dollars, Anne? Let's all go up to town and drink, suggested Phil. I am going to squander it in a wild, soulless revel of some sort, declared Anne gaily. At all events, it isn't tainted money like the check I got for that horrible, reliable baking powder story. I spent it usefully for clothes and hated them every time I put them on. Think of having a real life author at Patty's Place, said Priscilla. It's a great responsibility, said Aunt Jamesina solemnly. Indeed it is, agreed Pris with equal solemnity. Authors are kittle cattle. You never know when or how they will break out. Anne may make a copy of us. I meant that the ability to write for the press was a great responsibility, said Aunt Jimasina severely, and I hope Anne realizes it. My daughter used to write stories before she went to the foreign field, but now she has turned her attention to higher things. She used to say her motto was never write a line you would be ashamed to read at your own funeral. You better take that for yours, Anne, if you are going to embark into literature. Though to be sure, added Aunt Jimasina perplexedly, Elizabeth always used to laugh when she said it. She always laughed so much that I don't know how she ever came to decide on being a missionary. I'm thankful she did. I prayed that she might, but I wish she hadn't. Then Aunt Jamesina wondered why those giddy girls all laughed. Anne's eyes shone all that day. Literary ambitions sprouted and budded in her brain. Their exhilaration accompanied her to Jenny Cooper's walking party, and not even the sight of Gilbert and Christine walking just ahead of her, of, of her and Roy, could quite subdue the sparkle of her starry hopes. Nevertheless, she was not so wrapped from things of earth as to be unable to notice that Christine's walk was decidedly ungraceful. But I suppose Gilbert looks only at her face so, so like a man, thought Anne scornfully. Shall you be home Saturday afternoon, asked Roy. Yes. My mother and sisters are coming to call on you, said Roy quietly. Something went over Anne, which might be described as a thrill, but it was hardly a pleasant one. She had never met any of Roy's family. She realized the significance of his statement, and it had somehow an irrevocableness about it that chilled her. I shall be glad to see them, she said flatly, and then wondered if she really would be glad. She ought to be, of course, but would it not be something of an ordeal? Gossip had filtered to Anne regarding the light in which the gardeners viewed the infatuation of son and brother. Roy must have brought pressure to bear in the matter of this call. Anne knew she would be weighed in the balance. From the fact that they had consented to call, she understood that, willingly or unwillingly, they regarded her as a possible member of their clan. I shall just be myself. I shall not try to make a good impression, thought Anne loftily. But she was wondering what dress she would better wear Saturday afternoon, and if the new style of high hairdressing would suit her better than the old, and the walking party was rather spoiled for her. By night, she decided that she would wear her brown chiffon on Saturday, but would do her hair low. Friday afternoon, none of the girls had classes at Redmond. Stella took the opportunity to write a paper for the Philomathic Society and was sitting at the table in the corner of the living room with an untidy litter of notes and manuscript on the floor around her. Stella always vowed she would never write anything unless she threw away each sheet down as she completed it. Anne, in her flannel blouse and serge skirt, with her hair rather blown from her windy walk home, was sitting squarely in the middle of the floor, teasing the Saracat with a wishbone. Joseph and Rusty were both curled up in her lap. A warm, plummy odor filled the whole house, for Priscilla was cooking in the kitchen. Presently, she came in, enshrouded in a huge work apron with a smudge of flour on her nose, to show Aunt Jamesina the chocolate cake she had just iced. At this auspicious moment, the knocker sounded. Nobody paid any attention to it save Phil, who sprang up and opened it, expecting a boy with the hat she had bought that morning. On the doorstep stood Mrs. Gardner and her daughters. Oof. 
Anne scrambled to her feet somehow, emptying two indignant cats out of her lap as she did so, and mechanically shifting her wishbone from her right hand to her left. Priscilla, who would have said, who would have had to cross the room to reach the kitchen door, lost her head, wildly plunged the chocolate cake under a cushion on the ingle nook sofa, and dashed upstairs. Stella began feverishly gathering up her manuscript. Only Aunt Jamesina and Phil remained normal. Thanks to them, everybody was soon sitting at ease, even Anne. Priscilla came down, apronless and smudgeless. Stella reduced her corner to decency, and Phil saved the situation by a stream of ready small talk. Mrs. Gardner was tall and thin and handsome, exquisitely gowned, cordial with a cordiality that seemed a trifle forced. Aline Gardner was a younger edition of her mother, lacking the cordiality. She endeavored to be nice, but succeeded only in being haughty and patronizing. Dorothy Gardner was slim and jolly and rather tomboyish. Anne knew she was Roy's favorite sister and warmed to her. She would have looked very much like Roy if she had had dreamy dark eyes instead of roguish hazel ones. Thanks to her and Phil, the call really went off very well, except for a slight sense of strain in the atmosphere and two rather untoward incidents. Rusty and Joseph, left to themselves, began a game of chase and sprang madly into Mrs. Gardner's sink silken lamp and out of it in their wild career. Mrs. Gardner lifted her lore lorgnette and gazed after their flying forms as if she had never seen cats before and Anne, choking back slightly nervous laughter apologized as best she could you are fond of cats said mrs gardiner with a slight intonation of tolerant wonder and despite her affection for rusty was not especially fond of cats but mrs gardiner's tone annoyed her inconsequently she remembered that mrs john blythe was so fond of cats that she had kept as many as her husband would allow they are adorable animals, aren't they? She said wickedly. I have never liked cats, said Mrs. Gardner remotely. I love them, said Dorothy. They are so nice and selfish. Dogs are too good and unselfish. They make me feel uncomfortable, but cats are gloriously human. You have two delightful old china dogs there. May I look at them closely, said Aline, crossing the room towards the fireplace and thereby becoming the unconscious cause of the other incident. Picking up Magog, she sat down on the custom cushion under which was secreted Priscilla's chocolate cake. Priscilla and Anne exchanged agonized glances but could do nothing. The stately Aline continued to sit on the cushion and discuss China dogs until the time of departure. Dorothy lingered behind a moment to squeeze Anne's hand and whisper impulsively, I know you and I are going to be chums. Oh, Roy has told me all about you. I'm the only one of the family he tells things to, poor boy. Nobody could confide in Mama and Aline, you know. What glorious times you girls must have here. Won't you let me come often and have a share in them? Come as often as you like, Anne responded heartily, thankful that one of Roy's sisters was likable. She, could, she would never like Aline, so much was certain, and Aline would never like her, though Mrs. Gardner might be one. Altogether, Anne sighed with relief when the ordeal was over. Of all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are it might have been, quoted Priscilla tragically, lifting the cushion. This cake is now what you might call a flat failure, and the cushion is likewise ruined. Never tell me that Friday isn't unlucky. The people who send word they are coming on Saturday shouldn't come on Friday, said Aunt Jamesina. I fancy it was Roy's mistake, said Phil. That boy isn't really responsible for any, what he says when he talks to Anne. Where is Anne? Anne had gone upstairs. She felt oddly like crying, but she made herself laugh instead. Rusty and Joseph had been too awful, and Dorothy was a dear. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Chapter 37. Full-fledged BAs. Oh, I wish I were dead, or that it were tomorrow night, groaned Phil. If you live long enough, both wishes will come true, said Anne calmly. It's easy for you to be serene. You're at home in philosophy. I'm not, and when I think of that horrible paper tomorrow, I quail. If I should fail in what I, in it, what would Joe say? He won't fail. How did you get on in Greek today? I don't know. Perhaps it was a good paper, and perhaps it was bad enough to make Homer turn over in his grave. I've studied and mulled over notebooks until I'm incapable of forming an opinion of anything. How thankful little Phil will be when all this examinating is over examinating i've never heard of such a word well haven't i as good a right to make a word as anyone else demanded phil words aren't made they grow said anne never mind i begin faintly to discern clear water ahead where no examination breakers loom girls do you can you realize that our redmond life is almost over 
Oh, I can't, said Anne sorrowfully. It seems just yesterday that Pris and I were alone in that crowd of freshmen at Redmond, and now we are seniors in our final examinations. Potent, wise, and reverend seniors, quoted Phil. Do you suppose we really are any wiser than when we came to Redmond? You don't act as if you were by time, said Aunt Jimmy severely. Oh, Aunt Jimsy, haven't we been pretty good girls? Take us by and large. These three winters you've mothered us, pleaded Phil. You've been four of the dearest, sweetest, goodest girls that ever went together through college, averred Aunt Jamesina, who never spoiled a compliment by misplaced economy. But I mistrust you, haven't any too much sense yet. It's not to be expected, of course. Experience teaches sense. You can't learn it in a college course. You've been to college four years, and I never was, but I know heaps more than you do, young ladies. There are lots of things that never go by rule. There's a powerful pile of knowledge that you never get at college. There are heaps of things you never learn at school, quoted Stella. Have you learned anything at Redmond except dead languages and geometry and such trash, queried Aunt Jamesina. Oh, yes, I think we have, Auntie, protested Anne. We've learned the truth of what Professor Woodley told us last Phil Lomathic, said Phil. He said humor is the spiciest condiment in the feast of existence. Laugh at your mistakes, but learn from them. Joke over your troubles, but gather strength from them. Make a jest of your difficulties, but overcome them. Isn't that worth learning, Aunt Jimsy? Yes, it is, dearie. When you've learned to laugh at the things that should be laughed at and not to laugh at those that shouldn't, you've got wisdom and understanding. What have you got out of your Redman course, Anne? murmured Priscilla aside. I think, said Anne slowly, that I really have learned to look upon each little hindrance as a jest and each great one as the foreshadowing of victory. Summing up, I think that is what Redmond has given me. I shall have to fall back on another Professor Woodley quotation to express what it has done for me, said Priscilla. You remember that he said in his address, there is so much in the world for us all if only we only have the eyes to see it and the heart to love it and the hand to gather it to ourselves so much in men and women so much in art and literature so much everywhere in which to delight and for which to be thankful i think redmond has taught me that in some measure Anne. judging from what you all say remarked aunt jemisina the sum and substance is that you can learn if you've got natural gumption enough in four years at college what it would take about 20 years of living to teach you well, that justifies higher education, in my opinion. It's a matter I was always dubious about before. But what about people who haven't natural gumption, Aunt Jimsy? People who haven't natural gumption never learn, retorted Aunt Jimsina. Never, neither in college nor at life. If they live to be a hundred, they really don't know anything more than when they were born. It's their misfortune, not their fault, poor souls. But those of us who have some gumption should duly thank the Lord for it. Will you please define what gumption is, Aunt Jimsy asked Phil. No, I won't, young woman. Anyone who is gumption knows what it is, and anyone who hasn't can never know what it is. So there is no need of defining it. The busy days flew by, and examinations were over. Anne took high honors in English, Priscilla took honors in classics, and Phil in mathematics. Stella obtained a good all-round showing. Then came convocation. This is what I once have called an epoch in my life, said Anne, as she took Roy's violets out of their box and gazed at them thoughtfully. She meant to carry them, of course, but her eyes wandered to another box on her table. It was filled with lilies of the valley, as fresh and fragrant as those which bloomed in the green gables yard when June came to Avonlea. Gilbert Blythe's card lay beside it. Anne wondered why Gilbert should have sent her flowers for convocation. She'd seen very little of him during the past winter. He'd come to Patty's place only one Friday evening since the Christmas holidays, and they rarely met elsewhere. She knew he was studying very hard, aiming at high honors in the Cooper Prize, and he took little part in the social doings of Redmond. Anne's own winter had been quite gay socially. She had seen a good deal of the gardeners. She and Dorothy were very intimate. College circles expected the announcement of her engagement to Roy any day. Anne expected it herself. Yet just before she left Patty's place for convocation, she flung Roy's violet aside and put Gilbert's lilies of the valley in their place. She could not have told why she did it. Somehow old Avonlea days and dreams and friendships seemed very close to her in this attainment of her long-cherished ambitions. She and Gilbert had once pictured out merrily the day on which they should be captain gowned graduates in arts. The wonderful day had come, and Roy's violets had no place in it. Only her old friend's flowers seemed to belong to this fruition of old blossoming hopes which she had once shared. For years this day had beckoned and lured to her, but when it came, the one single keen, abiding memory it left with her was not that of the breath 
was not that of the breathless moment when the stately president of Redmond gave her cap and diploma and hailed her B.A. It was not of the flash in Gilbert's eyes when he saw her lilies, nor the puzzled, pained glance Roy gave her as he passed her on the platform. It was not of Aline Gardner's condescending congratulations or Dorothy's ardent, impulsive good wishes. It was one of strange, unaccountable pang that spoiled this long-expected day for her and left it in it a certain faint but enduring flavor of bitterness. The arts graduates gave a graduation dance that night. When Anne dressed for it, she tossed aside the pearl beads she usually wore and took from her trunk the small box that had come to Green Gables on Christmas Day. In it was a thread-like gold chain with tiny pink enamel heart as a pendant. On the accompanying card was written, with all good wishes from your old chum, Gilbert. And laughing over the memory, the enamel heart con conjured up the fatal day when Gilbert had called her carrot and vainly tried to make his peace with a pink candy heart, had written him a nice little note of thanks, but she had never worn the trinket. Tonight, she fastened it about her white throat with a dreamy smile. She and Phil walked to Redmond together and walked in silence. Phil chattered of many things. <sighs> Suddenly, she said, I heard today that Gilbert Blythe's engagement to Christine Stewart was to be announced as soon as convocation was over. Did you hear anything of it? No, said Anne. I think it's true, said Phil lightly. Anne did not speak. In the darkness, she felt her face burning. She slipped her hand inside her collar and caught at the gold chain. One energetic twist and it gave way. Ma'am. Anne thrust the broken trinket into her pocket. Her hands were trembling and her eyes were smarting. But she was the gayest of all the gay revelers that night and told Gilbert unregretfully that her card was full when he came to ask her for a dance. Afterwards, when she sat with the girls before the dying embers at Patty's place, removing the spring chilliness from their satin skins, none chatted more blithely than she of the day's events. Moody Spurgeon McPherson called here tonight after you left, said Aunt Jamesina, who had sat up to keep the fire on. He didn't know about the graduation dance. That boy ought to sleep with a rubber band around his head to train his ears not to stick out. I had a beau once who did that and improved him immensely. It was I who suggested it to him, and he took my advice, but he never forgave me for it. Moody Spurgeon is a very serious young man, young Priscilla. He is concerned with graver matters than his ears. He is going to be a minister, you know. <clears throat> well, I suppose the Lord doesn't regard the ears of a man, said Aunt Jamesina gravely, dropping all further criticism of Moody Spurgeon. Aunt Jamesina had a proper respect for the cloth, even in the case of an unfledged parson.